5, verses 1 through 13. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him a man out of the tombs with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? And he replied, My name is Legion, for we, for, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send him out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission, and the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. You may be seated. Good morning. It's good to see you here today. We have a nice sized crowd in the house and others at home watching on YouTube. And are we still doing Facebook or is that passe now? That's old school. We've moved on. Who knows where we'll be next? Rumble? Is there something called Rumble or who knows where we'll be next? I'm glad Kathy's here today. I was a little worried about Kathy last week. Um, keep her in your prayers. She'll be having some surgery soon. Uh, continue to remember Don and Vonnie and others in our congregation who are going through difficult times. Let's uh, begin this morning by picking up where Campbell just left off. We're in Mark chapter 5. Let's pick up in verse 14. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged Jesus that he might go with him. And Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and he began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And everyone marveled. Now, I don't know about you, but I am somewhat distressed and troubled by the townspeople. I mean, they've just witnessed the power of Almighty God. They've seen a miracle. A man with a host of demons who constantly hurts himself while terrorizing others has just been relieved of his problems by Jesus. Jesus steps in and he takes charge and with a simple word the demons flee pigs die and everyone is amazed and they ask Jesus to leave that seems to me to be an odd reaction perhaps we should put ourselves in their shoes because this guy is a problem to their community he's a disruptive person he has an uncontrollable situation he's frightening and if you want to just be honest about it he is an embarrassment to the community and so the community leaders have put their heads together to figure out how to deal with this guy and his problems and the best 
thing that they've decided to do at this point is to try to keep him subdued by using chains and irons. And it's obvious from the text that they tried this several times and only had limited success. You can almost hear them talking in their city council meetings. Okay, this time let's use bigger change and let's take out a few links to reduce the guy's leverage. And they try that, but to no avail. He still is able to break out of the chains. It seems that nothing they try works. And the question becomes, how do we manage the unmanageable? How do we control the uncontrollable? That's their problem. And so they kind of just do the best that they can. They drive this guy outside the community and they put him basically in the cemetery, out amongst the caves where the dead are buried. Get him away from everybody else. Not a solution to the problem, but it's the best they can do. Now, maybe some of us can relate to this guy because, like him, our life is out of control. We have problems that seem like they are unmanageable. We have our own set of demons working on us, trying to destroy us. Demons like alcohol and sex. Demons like addiction of every kind. And it's out of control. Maybe some of us have more subtle demons like greed and hatred and judgmentalism and jealousy and out of control anger. These demons are powerful demons and in fact they make us feel powerful at first and that's part of their deception, isn't it? But eventually it becomes obvious that we can't control them and instead they are controlling us. How do you manage the unmanageable? How do you control the uncontrollable? Well, like the townspeople, we just do the best we can, don't we? We hide, we lie, we cover up, we sweep under the rug, we withdraw, and that doesn't really solve anything, but it keeps our sin hidden. And it's easy to see the objective of Satan here, isn't it? This man is cutting himself with sharp stones. He is inflicting pain upon himself. He cries out, shrieks in pain, one version says. And really what's happening is he's committing a slow suicide as life just drains from his body. That's Satan's goal. Suffering pain, and ultimately, destruction. What happens when the demons go into the pigs? They jump off the cliff, into the water, and drown. That's what demons do. They destroy. They inflict pain and suffering. And church, Satan is at work today doing his best to inflict as much pain upon us and others as is possible. Satan wants to destroy us physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. He is at work today trying to destroy our health, destroying our dreams, destroying our hope, destroying our faith. He destroys relationships, marriages, churches, and friendship. He creates destruction any way he can. And you don't have to look far to see how good he is at this. And so some of us can relate to this demon-possessed man. Others of us might relate better to the townspeople because we've tried to help folks, haven't we? We've tried to help people who are in bondage. We've counseled with them. We've spent time with them. We've given them money to get, help them get back on their feet. We've given them meals. We've offered our friendship. We've given them transportation and housing. We've helped them to get jobs. And sometimes it works. And the people are appreciative. And their lives are changed. And they become productive members, not just of society, but productive members of the church. But more often than not, the demons are just too strong. Even with outside help, 
the demons just can't be controlled? How do you manage the unmanageable? Honestly, I think we do what the townspeople did. We just keep the problem at a distance. We tried, we did our best. And then here comes Jesus. Here comes Jesus, and he immediately takes control of an uncontrollable situation. Who are you, Jesus asks. They call themselves legion. Now, we've heard a lot of sermons about preachers talking about legions, legions of soldiers, legions of angels. Legion is a military term that means 6,000. That's what these demons call themselves. Now, were there 6,000 demons inside this guy? I don't know. Maybe. It was enough to fill a 2,000 herd pig, a 2,000 pig herd, wasn't it? 2,000 pigs. Bunch of demons inside this man. But I'm kind of wondering if these demons are not just being arrogant. That they're boasting, trying to make themselves seem unconquerable. We are legion. But when they say that to Jesus, it doesn't mean anything. And they know that. Jesus knows that. The demons don't put up a fight at all. In fact, they, they begin to no negotiate their surrender, don't they? There's no battle taking place here. Jesus is in control of this situation, and they are negotiating surrender. You remember back in chapter 3, just a few weeks ago, in verse 27, Jesus said, No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods until he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. And we said at the time, who is the strong man? Satan. Satan is the strong man, and Jesus went toe-to-toe -to -toe with him in the wilderness. Satan threw everything in his arsenal at the Son of God, trying to trip him up and make him sin, and instead, Jesus tied him up and marched out of that desert in victory. Satan has been bound and that's why now everywhere Jesus goes, when demons are present, all he has to do is say, out, and they're gone. He touches someone and the sickness is gone. Satan is bound and Jesus is plundering his house. What is Satan's house? Hell? No. The world. Three times in John's gospel, Jesus calls Satan the prince of this world. Satan's ultimate destination is the lake of fire that is spoken of in the book of Revelation. But right now, church, he lives in Austin, Texas, Buda, Texas, Kyle, Texas. Satan is alive and well here with us. But he's bound, and Jesus is plundering his house. God's son is on earth, Satan's turf, and Satan can't do anything about it. Now, I know there's a question right now that's troubling all of us. If Jesus can cure any disease, if he can heal any affliction, if he has power over all demons, then why doesn't he just completely wipe evil off the face of the planet right now and just be done with it? Why is evil still here with us? Why doesn't Jesus just make it leave? And the short answer is, he has. It's what God accomplished through Jesus at the cross. The destruction of Satan. It's a done deal. But it's not yet complete. It's one of those now but not yet things that we talk about from time to time. Satan has been defeated, but he's not yet been eliminated. When the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, he came into Satan's domain, Satan's kingdom. 
And that's why that battle out in the desert was so important. Jesus came to Satan's turf and met him head on, and Satan lost. Jesus established not only his power over Satan, but through his death and resurrection, he established his rule over all the earth. He is the Lord of heaven and Lord of earth. Through his death and resurrection, Satan's kingdom has been defeated and it is passing away. But not yet. The kingdom of God is victorious and is here to stay, but it's not yet here in its completeness. That's going to happen when Jesus comes back. On resurrection day, on judgment day. Here's how Paul puts it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Look at verse 22. For is in, in Adam all die, so also in Christ all shall be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. That's us. And then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after what? After destroying every rule and every authority and every power. When the end comes, all that's going to be left is the kingdom of God. No more evil, no more death, no more suffering, no more sickness. No more destruction. But it's not yet. And we say, okay, I, I, can, uh, I can accept that. We have the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, and they're kind of coexisting here in this world. And one day, the kingdom of Satan is going to completely pass away. But there's still that little question in the back of our mind that's just eating us alive, isn't it? Why do the people of God still suffer? I mean, we're part of the kingdom of God now, aren't we? We declare Jesus to be the Lord of our life. We serve him and him only. So why do we still suffer? Why doesn't Jesus just take the pain away from those of us who are following him? Why doesn't God give us everything we ask for in prayer for people who are struggling, for people who are sick? And brothers and sisters of the faith, I've been thinking about this for 62 years, and here's my answer to that. I don't know. I mean, I see those passages in Scripture that talk about how suffering and trials and persecution produces in us perseverance and makes us more reliant upon God. And I read those verses that talk about how much Jesus suffered and that our sufferings make us more like Jesus. But as to why it has to be that way, I don't know. Let me tell you what I do know. God loves us, and he knows what's best for us. And if suffering and sickness and trial and persecution is necessary for me to be in God's presence for all eternity, then I say, so be it. I put my trust in what Scripture says in Romans chapter 8. Now, if we are children of God, then we are also heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons and daughters of God. Folks, the power of Jesus Christ has no boundaries. There is nothing that can stop the power of God working through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus can do anything the Father wills. 
There is no sickness that Jesus cannot cure. There is no power greater than his. No evil force that is not obedient to his word the first time it's spoken. But it is also obvious, and please do not miss this, it is also obvious that no human being can control Jesus. He will constantly do the unexpected. And if we're afraid of the power of evil, if we can't manage the most horrible of Satan's afflictions, what are we going to do with the one more powerful than Satan? Well, we have a choice. The same choice that the townspeople in our story had to make. Look at the choice again, verses 14 through 17. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs, and they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. The townspeople don't want anything to do with a power they can't control. I mean, they can sort of manage this guy by wrapping him in chains and sending him out to the cemetery. But Jesus, they can't manage Jesus because he's more powerful, and they know it. In fact, they may have even more insight about that than the disciples about who Jesus is at this point in the gospel. They know that if this guy sticks around, eventually they're going to have no choice but to obey him. Do they want to do that? Well, they don't know. They're afraid. Wouldn't you be afraid of a power more powerful than the greatest power you had ever known? And he's just so unpredictable. He has just allowed 2,000 pigs to commit suicide, and he didn't put it to a vote of the townspeople or even the guys who are tending the pigs. He didn't ask their permission. He's unpredictable. You don't know what he's going to do next. Do you really want to give control of your life to Jesus? knowing that it's not going to be a 50-50 deal. We are not in partnership with Jesus. He's not going to ask our permission for anything. And he may not do what we tell him to do. He may not operate within our time frame. You can't control him. You can't say, Jesus, listen, here's how I'd like for you to run my life because that's not going to work, and the townspeople know it. So they say, we'd like for you to leave, please. And that's another thing about Jesus, probably worth writing down. If you tell Jesus to leave, he will. He'll let you manage or try to manage your unmanageable life and the lives of those around you as best you can. But praise God, there's another reaction in our story, and it comes from the guy who had the demons. Verse 18 again, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. Let me in the boat with you, Jesus. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And I wonder, why would this man react differently from the townspeople? And I think it's because he knows deep in his heart that Jesus is good. How does he know that? Personal experience. Now, that's about all he knows about Jesus. He knows Jesus is good and powerful, and that makes all the difference to him in the world. 
And now this man has a story to tell, a story of how Jesus set him free, how Jesus did for him what nobody else could do. He can tell the story of the townspeople and all that they did trying to manage him to no avail. And he can tell what Jesus did, who simply spoke a word and the demons were gone. His problems were solved. Now that's a story. But the man, of course, has another plan. He wants to follow Jesus back to the other side of the lake. Jesus, I'm coming with you. And Jesus says, no, my plan is a better plan. And my plan is for you to go and tell. Now, we've been in this gospel for a little while. You know, this is the first time, the first person that Jesus has commanded to go and tell. Every other exercised person, what did Jesus say to that person? Keep this on the down low. Be quiet about this. Don't tell anybody. Why is this guy the first? Well, it's because he's got the right story. He has the right message. Everybody else would love to be talking. They don't know what they're talking about, though. This guy does if he will do exactly what Jesus tells him to do. He's going to have the perfect message. Jesus says, you go and tell everyone what I've done for you. Now, he doesn't know everything, does he? He doesn't really know much at all. But he knows that Jesus is good news. Just go and tell what I've done for you. And verse 20 tells us that that is exactly what this man did. The townspeople run Jesus off. Good riddance. They're content to do the best they can trying to manage their unmanageable problems. They want to believe they're in control of their own lives, and that's why they're scared of Jesus. If he sticks around, they know they're going to have to surrender their control. Let me ask you a question. Do you really believe you have control of your life? Let's think about that for a second. How many things are going on in your life right now that you have no control absolutely over? I mean, there's not a thing in the world you can do about it. Number one is COVID-19. All these things going on in our lives. The cancer. The addictions. The sin. There are a lot of things going on in our life that we don't have much control over. Last week, we had no control over who was throwing the switch on our electricity or who was running the water meter. No control over that whatsoever. It's scary. See, we like to live under the illusion that we have control, and that's where the townspeople are. They'd rather live under an illusion than to surrender to the unpredictable control of the Son of God. But the man thought differently. He's just full of the good news of Jesus. He gives Jesus full control. How do we know that? Because he did what Jesus told him to do. We know what he wants to do, and Jesus says, we're not going to do that. Here's what I want you to do, and boom, the guy obeys. He gave Jesus full control. And here's your one-point sermon. You know you've given Jesus control of your life when you do exactly what he wants you to do and not what you want to do. The test is obedience. And you know what? If we say no to Jesus, he'll leave. Jesus doesn't stick around when he's not wanted. But if we'll realize his goodness as well as his power, 
if we'll acknowledge his authority, if we'll really do everything we can to get to know him better, you know what? We'd be fools to run him off, wouldn't we? May we surrender to Jesus. May we give him full control. Because the commission that Jesus gives to this previously demon-possessed man is the very same commission that he's given to you and me. Look at it again. Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. When we begin to surrender control to Jesus, when we begin to share our story of what Jesus has done for us with other people, Oh, church, we will be amazed by the things Jesus will do with that. He will use us to bring glory to the Father in heaven. He will use us to bless the lives of other people. You have a story to tell to the lady across the street, to the guy who lives behind you, to the people next door, to the person you work with. Tell your story, because it's good news. Let's close with a prayer. Father, you are all powerful. You speak and things happen. Lord God, Jesus came from you to show us what you're all about. And we thank you that he has shown us your goodness and holiness and your unlimited power. Father, help us see that any power and control we might have has been given to us as a gift by you, that you allow us a small measure of dominion in this world. But ultimately, all power belongs to you. And Father, we would be fools not to surrender everything to you. Help us surrender our lives to you, Father, to believe and trust that you really do know what's best for us in this life. And even though we may not understand that fully, help us to trust it with the knowledge that only you can manage the unmanageable. We thank you for Jesus who has defeated Satan, who has defeated sin and death, that we might have hope of eternal life with you. We pray in and praise the name of Jesus. And all the people of God say, amen. Last week, we had a young man give his life to Jesus. We have water this morning, and the baptistry is full. If you've not yet given your life to Jesus, may today be the day of your salvation. I'll be down here at the front at the end of our worship. If we have anyone wishing to be baptized, come on down and talk with me. If anybody here this morning is having a difficult time with something that's going on in your life and you want to pray about it let's get together and pray we got a lot of new newly painted rooms over here we could go in and socially distance six feet apart we'll pray together that'd be a good thing wouldn't it would love to pray with you this morning come and find me come and find chuck i'd love to pray with campbell key every now and then old campbell drops in and says let me pray for you I love you, church. This time, one of our shepherds, Brother Chuck Meisenheimer, is going to come and dismiss us.